So I want you to, uh, as we begin today, to imagine something. Maybe some of you won't actually have to imagine this, but I want you to imagine that you have a serious shoulder pain. Anybody here have a serious shoulder pain? And we got one, two, okay. I mean, so bad, it's really hard, you know, for you to move your arm. That's the bad news. The good news is, is that there is help if you would do something. There are some exercises that you can do. There is a, a stretchy band that you can purchase that can help make your shoulder better. All right, so imagining now, if you, if you PB, if you purchase the band, and you RA, you read all about how it works and all about what you have to do and, and, and believe that if you do those things, your shoulder will be healed, will it result in F, freedom from pain? No, no, why not? If you, if, you, if you purchase the band and read all about it, won't it bring about a cure? Won't it help you? The answer is no, because what's missing in that formula? You've got to do it. You've got to put the exercises into practice. You've got to, you've got to use what you've purchased and used what you know to bring about freedom from pain. So let me ask you this question, thinking about this in regards to faith. <coughs> um, imagine that there, is this, uh, that there is this pain caused by sin in your life. That's the bad news. The good news is that there is a cure. There is help for that ailment. And that good news is through, through putting your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So if you PB, purchase a Bible, and RA, read all about Jesus, if you do those two things, will it result in F? Will it result in, in a faith that brings freedom from pain? No. Because while these two things are important and they're necessary, there's one more step, and that is you have to do something with your faith. You have to put it into practice. You have to use it. You, you have to take advantage and of what the gifts that Jesus gives you for that healing, for that freedom to become real in your life. Not only do you know, and believe, but you have to do what Jesus has asked you to do for faith to be full that brings about a freedom. So this is what we're going to be talking about today as we open the book of James, as we look at the next section of this letter that he wrote to the early Christians. And these ideas are all summarized in one verse that James says, unless it, faith, produces good works, it's dead. It's useless, James 2.17. So as we continue our study today, we're, we're going to look at portions of James 1 and 2. So get out your Bibles if you brought your Bibles. Take out your study sheet. It's got the scriptures that we're going to look at today and the main points that we're going to make. Take, take that out. As we look at this theme from the book of James where he says, hey, there are two kinds of faith. There are two ways that faith can, can, can uh, express themselves in our lives. And one is through dead faith, and the other is through a living faith. Now, a dead faith, James says here, is kind of useless. A dead faith is a faith that knows all of the right things about Jesus from the Bible, but keeps it theoretical, keeps it as ideas, keeps it as philosophical kind of knowledge. A living faith, though, has, does all of that, believes all of the right things about Jesus, knows who Jesus is, and goes one step further, and that puts all of those truths about Jesus 
into practice every day in every area of their lives. And we're going to look at three characteristics today of living faith. And those are written on your sheet if you want to follow along. Three characteristics of living faith that makes all of the difference in our lives. Here we go. Here's the first. Living faith moves from believing that to believing in, in regard to Jesus Christ. Moves from believing that to believing in. Now to make this point, I want to show you two pictures. First is this. We all know who that is, right? Adolf Hitler. How many people here believe that he was an actual person who lived in the past? All right, okay. How many people believe that he was the leader of Nazi Germany? Okay. How many people believe that he killed tens of thousands of Jews? Okay. Well, if you believe all of that about Hitler, you must all be Nazis then, right? Right? I mean, you, don't you believe all of those things about him? Doesn't that equate that you believe in him? No, there's a difference, obviously, between believing that and believing in. And, and just to make that point in a different direction, here's one of our, the classical portraits of Jesus. So how many people in the world believe that he was a real historical figure that lived a long time ago. A lot of people. And how many people believed that he was the leader of the Christian church? Okay. How many people believe that he, he died and gave his life as a sacrifice? Okay. So if you believe, you know, people that believe those three things, then are they automatically Christians? Is it possible to believe those three things about Jesus and not believe in Jesus? Is, it, is that possible? And the answer is yes, according to James. In fact, uh, he, uh, he says it in, this, in a verse in a, in a really striking way in James chapter 2. He says this, you say you have faith because you believe that there is one God, and we can put, and that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, and that, and that, and that. You believe that there is one God, good for you. But even the demons believe that. And they tremble. Have you ever thought about that? That the evil one and the whole and all of the, the ones who work for the evil one believe that. There is one God. And believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And in fact, this could be how the, you would word the Apostles' Creed for demons. I believe that God is the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe that Jesus Christ is his only Son. And that he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. That he was born of the Virgin Mary. That he suffered under Pontius Pilate. That, 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 that. Isn't that amazing? To know all of those things in the Apostles' Creed are facts that the evil one believes in. But that's not how the Apostles' Creed is worded, right? We just read it. What's the difference? How do we begin the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. So the key word of, with living faith is moving from believing that, things about Jesus and God, to believing in. And that is the key for having a living faith. Uh, Jesus puts it this way. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Those who believe, what? In me, even though they die, they will live. Believing in starts with believing the truth that Jesus is who the Bible says he is. But then it moves from believing that to believing in, which means a living faith puts greatest love, highest love, trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I just want to say, if you're here today, and you would say, well, yeah, I, I, I never thought about this. I mean, I believed all these things that Jesus, 
but I haven't taken that step to believe in Jesus, that's, that's an important step that anyone who would follow Jesus would do. It's great that you are here. It's great that you believe what you believe. But God calls us to move from believing that to believing in, to putting our greatest love, our highest trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And here's how we do it. We, we go to the next part of what James says. A living faith moves from hearing God's word to doing God's word. Uh, James writes in James 1, uh, 21, humbly accept the implanted word which has the power to save your souls, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James makes it clear. It's possible to hear God's word. It's possible to read God's word and not necessarily believe it or do it. That's the difference between a dead faith and a living faith. And what James says here, it's all the key word to move from hearing to doing from a dead faith to a living faith is the word accept. Humbly accept the implanted word. Humbly accept the implanted word. Um, that word is used in an important way in the world of medicine. Uh, is there anybody here who who's, has a transplant of any kind? Anybody here know someone who's had a transplant? Okay. Now, after they do the surgery and they, and they sew the person up, there is a crucial question that has to be answered, that the doctors are hoping and praying happens. And what's that question? Will the body accept the new organ or reject it? Accept it or reject it? To ex for the body to accept the organ, that means the body the body uh, integrates that organ into its functioning. It incorporates the use of that organ into the body's functioning so that the body is, has new health and new life. In the same way, God's word is transplanted, James says, into our hearts. The key question is, are we going to accept it or reject it? To accept God's word humbly means that we incorporate all of God's truth into our lives, into every thought, into every action, into everything we do. It shapes what we do, how we do. A living faith accepts God's word and transforms our hearts and lives to serve Jesus Christ as our Lord. And, and James says here, God's implanted word, when it's accepted and believed and incorporated and, we, and a person begins doing it out of thankfulness, it has the power to save your souls. Not only saving in the future to heaven, but it has the power right now to save us from the trouble that we would get ourselves into because we would make wrong and sinful and foolish choices. Jesus puts it this way. For everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. I hope your desire is that your life is built on the foundation, on the rock of, of Jesus Christ. And, and in this little parable, Jesus says, then you will have the strength to withstand the hardest storms of life. You're, you will be saved in those hardest of times because God's strength and God's peace will be with you to give you the power to endure. So living faith moves from believing that to believing in, moves from hearing only to hearing and doing. And the third point that James makes, living faith moves from feeling sorry to showing compassion for others in need. James says this, suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes or who don't have enough to eat. What good is it in your, if you say to them, well, God bless you and keep warm and eat well if you don't give them the necessities of life? And the answer to that question is, yeah, it doesn't do any good. So James is saying a living faith in Jesus Christ empowers us 
to not only feel sorry for someone when we see them in need, but move from feelings to showing compassion, to doing for others what God would do for them what, and what God has done for us, to move our faith into serving people who are in need. This is what Jesus has done for us. I mean, Jesus is the example for how to move from just feeling sorry to showing compassion. And Jesus did this over and over again as he healed people who were sick and touched people that nobody else would touch. How he would feed hungry people, not only kind of people who were hungry in their stomachs, but hungry in their souls. Jesus cared for those that were lonely. He cared for those who had needs in their lives. And ultimately, Jesus gave his life as a sacrifice so that we could be free from our sin. So what James is saying here is follow the example of Jesus, what Jesus has done for you, that your faith would move you from not just not only feeling, but showing compassion, putting your love in action for other people, which is why at this church we are committed to helping everyone in this church develop a greater living faith in Jesus Christ. And we do that by, by providing all kinds of opportunities to show compassion to people in need in our community and around the world, which is why we have our emphasis on Royal Family Kids. This is why we, um, why we support Wilsonville Community Sharing and we do food for thought, giving backpacks to the kids at Beckman Creek for food on the weekends. It's why we, we support African Smile and, and help people in Tanzania. It's why we support the Catalyst and care for people and do things for people that aren't able to do them for, do things for themselves. In fact, James puts it this way in James 1. He says, here, here are the beliefs and the way of life that God our Father accepts as pure and without fault. When widows are in trouble, take care of them. And do the same for children who have no parents. Last year, our Catalyst Ministry, we helped two widows in our community who lived in, in mobile homes. Royal family kids, that's what we're doing for, you know, I mean, we're putting this truth, this verse into action because, G because our Lord is full of compassion and mercy and that has been poured into our hearts. We take that same compassion and mercy and let it flow through us to bless people around us. Now, some might think, well, what James is saying here about dead faith and faith and living faith is kind of at odds with, with maybe some of the rest of the Bible. What what Paul teaches about faith. So while it may seem there could be a difference when you really understand what Paul is saying, there is, there, they, there is an integrity between what both of them are saying about what our faith is. Here's, let me close with this verse. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace is what God does for us in Jesus Christ. Faith is, again, our, our response to what God does for us first. So by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift from God, not the result of works. If you stop there, you go, well, it sounds like Paul is saying one thing and James is saying another. But keep reading. Not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus. For what? For good works. We are created by God, saved by Jesus Christ, so that our faith lives out itself in action as we shine God's light and love so that others will know that there is a God of grace and mercy and compassion. And so, this is the final point that we'll make for today. That our salvation and our faith is not determined by what we do, but is demonstrated by what we do. We live out our faith. We do 
all of the things that we do, not to earn our way into heaven, but because we are on our way to heaven. And we do that out of our thankfulness to show God that we honor him. And we put our lives on the line into action every day to, to say that thank you in that real way. So today is Mother's Day. Hey, what we remember on Mother's Day are, are all, all the things that moms do that, that make such a difference. And a mother's love for a child is beautiful. It, 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 a mother's love for a child is not something that's theoretical, it's not philosophical. A mother's love for a child is real, it is tangible. In the same way we're saying our faith in Jesus Christ is real and tangible and it shows itself in a thousand ways. A mother's love shows itself in a thousand ways for a child. Our faith in Jesus Christ shows itself in a thousand ways as we, as we serve him. So uh, I want to invite Robin forward. She's written a, a, a poem about Mother's Day and you'll, you'll see the connection between what we're talking about and mothers. So moms, this is to honor your love in action. Moms do so much, little things but big things, for many years. And it's a privilege to share this poem that the Holy Spirit gave me many years ago when my kids were small. And I lamented over the endless, repetitive tasks that young mothers have to do to care for their family. And for me, often extra kids that were in my home and in my care. It's called A Mother's Work. Each day I do a thousand tasks, repetitive, each one. Each day, another thousand tasks still are left undone. I've wiped a thousand fingerprints from tabletops and walls. I've picked up a thousand socks and shoes from the floor of the front hall. I've pushed the swing a thousand times. I've dried a thousand tears. I've changed a thousand diapers and wiped a thousand little rears. Each day I chop, I cook, I serve, I clean it up, and then I grocery shop to buy more food so I can cook and clean again. Each day I do a thousand tasks, repetitive each one. Each day another thousand tasks still are left undone. I've done a thousand loads of laundry. I've poured a thousand cups of juice. I've kissed a thousand owies and tied a thousand little shoes. I've read a thousand stories, some a thousand times. I've changed a thousand videos and read a thousand nursery rhymes. Each day I stoop a thousand times to pick up a thousand toys. And a thousand times a day I wish I could just turn down the noise. Each day I do a thousand tasks, repetitive each one. I often wonder, would it matter if these tasks were left undone? In the midst of my 1,000 tasks, I often fail to see. Someone else once did 1,000 tasks each day to care for me. I don't remember single tasks done each day as these. I remember a loving home filled with warm memories. Though each task alone might seem incidental, insignificant, together they make a mother's love for which there is no equivalent. Each day I do a thousand tasks. Lord, help me remember each day that I give and receive a thousand times more than any treasure could ever buy. So what started as a lament, or through what started as a lament, the Holy Spirit helped me see a whole lot more that it's a privilege and it's a treasure to put love into action. And we receive so much more than we give. And he also helped me see that I depend on his love to love others. It was just 
natural at the end of the poem to turn to him in prayer and say, Lord, help me. Help me remember. We need God's power to love others. We love because he first loved us. So really, it's our Father's love for which there is no equivalent, and that's something we can all celebrate. So moms, we honor and we thank you, and we celebrate God's love at work through you. Well, let us join together and remember what we've said this morning as we sing this verse of the hymn.